sick. We're doing it. We're recording. Always. Would you like to do the honors? Yes. There you go. Do you want to do the pouring? Like that? No. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Thanks for doing this, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for coming all the way out here to visit. Yeah, yeah. So, so can you tell people where we're at right now? We're at Robbins Island Park in Wilmer, Minnesota, my hometown. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Lucas Kramer is a very good artist friend of mine. Um, I've known him for about fi 15 years. Or <laughs> Uh, we're like, we're like four maybe? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Four, I, I think about, I, well, I think we're up, up to five almost. Yeah, yeah, almost five, almost five years. I met you at the Watts Atelier in Encinitas. Oh, yeah. um, uh, you, I guess, uh, you're from Minnesota and your background is, I guess, you went to art school and did, did all that kind of stuff. And then, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I did like the traditional, right. I'll let you go first. I did the traditional go to high school, like, go right. to college, get a degree. Yeah, yeah. System thing. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess part of the, you know, this whole thing, this whole interview podcast show thing, it's not really an interview show, it's more of, like, talking to people who have lived, you know, they've gone through a certain gauntlet, and they've, you know, done things, or they've lived intentional lives in some ways, and they've made sacrifices. Oh, yeah. With money, or, you know, other more traditional paths in mm -hmm. order to, like, pursue some creative thing, you know. And to me, it seems like, you know, you went to art school, you, you went into debt, you know, you did the whole, like, um, traditional route, and then you found it wasn't for you, and you went to an atelier instead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I could talk about that for hours, but, um, the, uh, the traditional school system was, it was good for what it was. The school I went to was pretty high quality. Yeah. Um, the teachers were were decently engaged as much as like you know administrative faculty can be and I, I was lucky to have one really good teacher at the college I went to this is University of Dubuque in Iowa I went there for computer graphics mostly to learn 3d for video games right and the teacher that was the head of the 3d program Greg was very good yeah but um, gosh probably two and a half three years into that program I didn't ha hadn't felt like I had learned what I wanted to right it was decent um, but I had realized once I once I began to get into photo editing Photoshop and then texturing for 3d models right that was when I shifted to painting and just started falling in love with drawing and painting in Photoshop right. yeah and so that was kind of like it took me you know a couple years and tens of thousands of dollars to realize like oh I actually want to paint and draw yeah right and then finished that degree up early got out of there uh, worked for a little bit just doing I was doing tech support and a bunch of other stuff yeah um, worked at Best Buy for a while and just kind of floated because I wasn't sure I was just drawing for myself for yeah. fun right trying to learn and but not not really engaging with any any studying directly because I was I was in Illinois at the time and so we're like Peoria area yeah and that there wasn't much of an art scene at least not that I could find right. um, and so I after quitting a job and quitting that job that I was miserable at moved home for a few months like three months and then committed to learning how to draw on my own was studying on my own here in Wilmer for a bit, doing the online program for the atelier. Yeah, yep. just for I only did it for a month, and then I was like, I need to just go there. Yeah, because I saw the roster of teachers. Um, Graciano brought me there just because of his magic cards. Yeah, magic was the the game that kind of like because I was playing that a lot in college as I'm just like hanging out with people at the in the department and playing it right looking at the art and the artists and realizing that these people are doing it for a living yeah and they're incredibly skilled at it right and i was like all right can i do it mm -hmm. yeah well it was a it was the 
it was the thing that brought me to the atelier because I could see, uh, I think they've got like Eric, Lucas, and Tom have all done magic cards. That is too, I think. Nice. Yeah. But uh, just having three magic artists teaching mm -hmm. in the same spot, it's like, you'll mm -hmm. if that's the direction you want to go, you'll get it there. Mm -hmm. But So that brought me to it. And then mm -hmm. two right. years of full-time school. So Yeah. Well, to me, I mean, it seems like your story is pretty common where people will go to these expensive art schools, you know, mm -hmm. they'll get these degrees and stuff, but they ultimately won't feel like they have the skills necessary to actually do the jobs they really want to do. And yeah. I think it's kind of tragic how common that story is. Yeah, it's a... Yeah, they didn't... They didn't teach... They certainly didn't teach drawing and painting, and so the int my interest in that just was completely self-motivated. Yeah. It was the only... It was just self-study. Um, there's just no way to truly prepare somebody in four years. Right. Especially if it's not a, like a trade school or like a specific type of program. If it was, it was a, it was a specific. It was like a bachelor's in science in computer graphics and interactive media. So I learned, I learned all the Adobe Suite. I learned how to edit. I learned. So it's like, I got a big multimedia knowledge base right. of editing, three D modeling, texturing. I even got to do some sculpting, uh, mud box, the whole. Right like the earlier um, game asset workflow to like bring something into Unreal Editor and all these things. So yeah. I learned that back, I don't know, was it 2012, 2013 yeah. maybe? Right. And, but I was, I, I wouldn't say I was good at it. Uh, I enjoyed it enough to stick with the program, but I just kind of felt like this isn't, once I got into it, I was like, this is not exactly what I want to do. Yeah. I want something more immediate and drawing and painting was like just felt like the thing I needed to do right. be able to just directly absolutely get it out yeah yeah well and I guess it's uh it's strange how that particular um set of skills it's I mean it's like you you could make more money being a 3d modeler right it's probably easier to get jobs being a texture artist or yeah you know, definitely easier to get jobs yeah right but um, it's um it's not as re it wouldn't be as rewarding for me yeah the, the the team collaboration aspect of like having a modeler and a texturer and an animator and having them all come together to create one thing is pretty cool. Right. But I would still want to. Uh, I would still want to know how to draw. Yeah. I like that. That was too. It was too much of a pull to that right. for me to ignore it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and I, I guess part of the thing that I want to ask you is like, why was that so important to you? You know, it's like, why is the act of drawing and painting something that's actually worth pursuing, you know? Oh, man. I mean, for me, it was important because I had these ideas, these things I wanted to explore uh, just from my imagination, but I, I was attempting to paint and draw them, yeah. but I couldn't. I didn't have the skill set. I didn't have the knowledge or how to do it. And so I was, the years I spent just being frustrated with not being able to express what's in my mind. Yeah. Um, and that, that alone, just like, as I began to be able to do that more and more clearly yeah. and pro just project something and work with an object or an idea or whatever, um, an imagination project, once I got better at doing that, it was just clear that I, I just need to keep pursuing it because it's intrinsically... Meaningful. Helping me, yeah. yeah it's intrinsic. It's and uh, there is also just the pure, simple fun of it. Right. That you know, if we can get out of our heads, it's it's always really fun. Yeah. You know? yeah absolutely. Well, see, to me, it seems like I mean, while I was at the school, you quickly became one of the advanced students. You know, it seems like to me, you trained there for a relatively short period of time and got there and got really good really quickly. Yeah, know? it was like two years. Yeah, yeah, and for a lot of people, that's not how it happens. You know, a lot of people, it's like. I, it takes longer, you know, it takes yeah. four or five, maybe ten years to get, you know, to where you're at. And to me, I was I was very impressed with just the, the skill level that you got to so quickly, you know. And I, the, the reason I'm mentioning that, not to, like, pump you up or anything. No, please just, do. Uh, you're the best. <laughs> yeah, you're the yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but, but not like, quite, but. Yeah. But, but it's like, you, you know, you, you were good. You know, you were, you, you had skills that, you know, you progressed very quickly, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I guess, you know. I think it's something that if someone is truly interested in getting really good in a couple of years, they could do it. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's it's yeah. not a matter of like having talent inherently or, you know, um, 
I guess, any God-given gift or anything. It's no. more just about like a... It's not God-given gift at all. But. I mean, we were talking about this yesterday where I was I was comparing you to like a monk. Where when <laughs> I go to your, your, your apartment in Encinitas, it was like, you know, you had your drawings on the wall. You had art books. You didn't have any game no, gaming systems. No, didn't have anything. You had art books, food, a bathroom, and drawing materials. Yeah, I had like a bedroll. And yeah, like, yeah, seriously. Yeah. And, uh... Even now, it's like you, you don't actually have a bed in your bedroom. You well, know? that's for lower back issues. But, uh, well, well, it's still, <laughs> but I, same I, I, thing, yeah. Yeah, I like to, you know. It's, uh, yeah. it's very, yeah, I do live in a, in a kind of a strange way to most people, but it's, um, I've, ha- I've had this thought many times, and as much as I, I would love to constantly travel and go to all these crazy cool places... Um, the work I enjoy doing at the end of the day is staring at a screen or a piece of paper or canvas and it doesn't really matter where you are right you can do that and yeah it's it's perfectly fine and uh, yeah so I do live kind of kind of a monkish life it's sort of it's just a singular focus yeah. you know I I do my best to like take care of myself so I'm not being unhealthy I learned those lessons early on right that if you burn the candle at both ends, you pay for it in the long run. Or eat too many roasted marshmallows. Yes, yeah. one and one and done yeah, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, me. That's, that's fair enough, man. Um, um, yeah. Well, no, but but I, again, I, I I've been talking to a lot of people about this. Where um, I think that learning art is actually incredibly simple. It's extremely easy if you have a why to it. If you understand why you're doing it in the first place. And, yeah. Um, like if you are really serious about learning art, you have to make the sacrifices to actually get really good really quickly. You know. It's like, you know, maybe eating junk food all the time is fun, but it doesn't allow doesn't you. Doesn't serve you. That doesn't help you focus. Nope. It doesn't help you focus on, you know. It'll get in the way. Yeah, yeah. And yep. I, I think it's like, or again, video games or any of that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm not saying that stuff's apparently bad. No. You know, I think we both play video games. If it, Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I go through periods of time where I'll completely, like you said, like, I, I think, man, I, when I first uh, moved out of Peoria, uh, I sold my gaming PC mm-hmm. and bought just like a little Mac Mini so that I wouldn't play games on it. Mm-hmm. And it was just a Photoshop machine and that was it. Mm-hmm. And that was part of the process. I've gone through like multiple cycles of unconsciously accumulating things that become distracting mm-hmm. and then going through the process of re- reaffirming and focusing again and right. purging some stuff. Uh, and I've done that so many times that I've learned that it's I don't actually need that much yeah. to be happy and the even the desire and the accumulation of things can get it's can become a distraction itself, yeah. just the desire to like constantly want more stuff. Own things and yeah. stuff and however, I still have pieces of art that I covet really like quite a lot. Yeah. Uh, so we yeah. started every fifteen or twenty minutes or Oh, that's right, okay. Um but, you know and, and it but it's like a um, to me, it seems like kind of ironic, you know. In order to become a really good artist, you almost have to sacrifice the one for having things, you know. Which is, you know, art is a thing, you know. Yeah, it's like a, yeah. You kind of have to embrace a, somewhat of a stoic, you know. For a while, for sure. Well, it, um, I think that the study of art is very, like, it's very tedious and very. It's actually very painful a lot of the time, you know. Oh uh, yeah. Um, in the sense where yes, whenever you do a drawing, like a long graphite drawing or a long painting, there's a chance you're going to fail, right? There's yeah, a, there's, there's a pretty big chance you're going to fail. It's totally possible. Like yeah. Every time you step into a new painting or a project or whatever, the potential of failure is there. Yeah, and it's I would say it's higher than pretty much... Um, anything else you could do in your in your in your life, like if you play a video game, you're not going to fail. If you right. you know go for a run, you're not probably like you know. But yeah, if, it's if you, maybe music. Yeah, yeah. A couple right. other things, but yeah. Well, and it's it's like the idea of making it like art. I'm encapsulating that into music and you know, oh yeah, like, like any any sure. form of creation, you know, creative expression and all that. And yeah, it's like a it's scary because you're, you're you are probably going to fail. You know, you will at some point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and it's like you're probably going to fail most of the time. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, and, I would agree. Like. There's, there's a, that is inevitable yeah. and you have to, you have to assemble, you have to reassemble and like retrain yourself to have a different relationship with failure yeah. as, as a 
just inevitable. It's part of the process. Like, well, it was it was strange. Like when I would see the advanced students when I was first starting out Watts, like you or Chris, mm -hmm. or you, even like watching some of the instructors with a drawing. You know, they would like make the torso way too long, or sure. there would just be a moment of like complete like I don't know what I'm doing. You know. And, yeah. Um, seeing that happen was strange because it's like, you know, I, you know, after 20,000 hours of doing this, you would expect to have some amount of mastery to the point where yeah. those moments wouldn't happen. But it's it you would you would think that, but I think the actual mastery is the ability to recognize those types of mistakes and errors and just move through them. Yeah, right. That's the mastery. It's the because every decision you make in a painting or a drawing is a potential failure yeah. and a mistake, quote unquote, right? Um, but to get into like a good flow state where you're able to like do the work that you want to do and, and have it look how you want it to look and all these, whatever metrics you gauge good art, um, to get to that point, you do have to just be okay with those little failures. Well, I, I've honestly found that the study of art is pretty similar to just the study of being successful at anything. Yeah. There, there are a lot of parallels of just like you're gonna fucking suck at everything that you try whether it's like starting a business or yep. relationships or drawings or you know pretty like swimming I don't know um, and it's it's all about embracing that failure and not letting that failure tie you know have any effect on how you feel about yourself yeah yeah well that's the hard part I mean it's 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 a huge blow to the ego when something doesn't come out the way you want it to it can be yeah you know and there's you have to be able to separate i have to be able to separate myself the person from the thing i'm creating absolutely it's it, it's vital and, and it's i think it's tough because it's like you you have to give up the highs with the lows you yeah know? it's like you can like when you do a high you can no longer take credit for it because the second you do then it's like your ego inflates. You, yeah. know, you feel like, oh, I'm done. You know, I've done it. Yeah, you know, I did it. I'm, you know, I'm the best. I'm a good like artist now. For five seconds, and then you go back to training and training, and it's like, oh man, I can't quick sketch today, or I can't. Right. Oh, what the hell's going on? Yeah, right. Well, and it becomes it's, it's like a, I remember in uh, the art spirit, Robert Henri. Well, I'm sure you've heard this a million yeah. times. It's like be a master at whatever level that is. You know? Yeah. And I think mastery is way more of a mindset of just how you feel about yourself and you know you're in, like an intentionality with your work versus you know finally putting in 10,000 hours and earning the right to call yourself a master or artist or yeah I, I'm I'm well over 10,000 hours and I'm not a master yeah in any step of the imagination like it's yeah. you know those first five years where I wasn't going to the school I, I kind of I like had committed intensely to learning how to draw when I was like 19 yeah but the first few years, I was stumbling through self-teaching. Yeah. I was lucky that I, I had purchased good books like Hampton. and yeah. So good fundamental books. And I practiced from those. But they were absolutely just ter terrible yeah. drawings. But I kept it to myself because I was going through college and working other jobs. And I was just right. like, that, that period of time where art is a hobby, but you can feel it's more than a hobby. Right. That section was luckily very short for me. It's only a few years. I didn't wait until my 30s yeah. to to commit to this thing that I was pulled to. Right. I started cutting things out of my life and saying I got I have to make space for this. I have to make space for this because it's more important. It was more important than school. Like I was, I went from getting A's and B's to getting B's and C's because yeah. I was like I'm not gonna put any more energy into anything other than just get my degree because I wanted right. to get out. Yeah. That's I'm fine with that. That yeah. was a perfectly valid trade off because I, I was more I was happier and more directed. Right. Which is what I always wanted. So Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, it's but it's true, like the mastery thing, I don't really know how I feel about that because I I think it's mostly just mental. Absolutely. I yeah. think I think it's hundred percent mental. It's like, and time, of well, course. I was talking to Morgan Weisling about this and he was uh, telling me Teaching art is actually very, very easy. You can explain everything you need to know to be a, a master artist in like an hour. You know. Yeah, that's like, true. You but then you have to. You can spend a lifetime working. Absolutely. On those yeah, yeah. You spend, you know, a life like you can explain gesture in like a minute. You know. Yeah. And you're like, do you do that for the rest of your life? And then just okay, just now do it for two hundred hours, and then you'll probably be better. Hopefully. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. Who knows? We don't know. Yeah, yeah. And that—that's the truth of it. It's like it's kind of raw in that way. It's raw in the sense that the feedback is immediate. It's like playing music, right? Yeah. The feedback 
of the quality of it is directly in front of your face and it's developing as you make decisions and so it's really that that comes back to the separating your ego your sense of self and self-worth from the artwork yep. is really challenging when as you're doing it it's it's bad oh, yeah, and, it's, it, and it's developing Absolutely, poorly and you're like yeah. oh my god yeah, and this people are awful. looking at it yeah and, yeah yeah and it's uh, and it happens though like that's part of the deal well and you could say that you're an egoless you know i'm i'm perfectly zen but no. when that happens it's like a, an observation of how much you actually care about what other people think you know yeah that's true and like it's, all that mental uh spinning that people can do i do it too right, right? thinking about what other people think right the one of the things that helped me a lot i went through like a period of maybe two or three months where I was internally just maintaining this phrase every time I would sit down to draw at the school, uh, it was essentially like, how to, I don't know how to put it in words exactly, but hmm. the, the, the thoughts, even about yourself, like the thoughts of, thoughts of like, uh, I'm not good enough, I won't be good enough, they're going to see me be bad or even just I need to get better yeah. all of those thoughts about yourself do not help the drawing yeah. in any way right. they're completely irrelevant and they're a distraction yeah. you could be having thoughts of like how do I want to design that shape what kind of edge do I want to make do I like how this looks and what do I need to do those are productive thoughts right. and then there's like ego thoughts Yeah. Right. and at, at the end of the day like the service to the drawing is not thinking about how popular you're going to be right it's it's irrelevant well and, and acknowledging that even though you've done a hundred thousand hours of figure drawing that doesn't mean you're going to come in and do a great part figure drawing not every time no and well, yeah. everybody's got their low periods too where it's just everything's awful absolutely yeah yeah well and, it, and it's embracing that like you know again it's embracing the fact that you are a loser you know <laughs> yeah. no, 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 not in like a literal sense not in, yeah there's this is the the difference between like uh, making sure you have a healthy sense of self-worth yeah. but a humble ego right. of okay it doesn't like I'm gonna have bad days I'm gonna have good days celebrate the good days that's awesome you know we all have those moments where it's like oh I'm really happy with how that turned out or maybe it fl like I've had some of my best paintings have flowed within like three or four hours yeah and then some of my hardest fought most worked paintings look overworked yeah and it's right. like yeah you know the traditional thing that people would think is that you spent longer on it so it should be better right no yeah. that's it's not that linear it's not linear at all really yeah um and so it's 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 but it's not random either like mental clarity intention focus and discipline all play their part in the process of right. trying consistently getting something good yeah you know well i i, I mean i have talked to a lot of people about the idea I, i've met a lot of people who are kind of they bash figure drawing in general, it's just this useless. Uh, weird. Well, no, but I, I, I pe people that we know and respect. Yeah. You know that they're like figure drawing. You should focus all your time on it. It's useless. You know, it's only for, like, it, it's not an art form in and of itself. You know. That's wild. That um, just doesn't make sense to my brain. Well, but, but um, you know, I, uh, I was listening to Steve Houston give a talk, and he was saying, uh, a figure drawing is a lot like meditation. You know, when you with a line when you make a core shadow too dark or a head too small or whatever like your brain was thinking about something else yeah almost the, always well because the decision it's like figuring out how big or small a head is is actually a very easy thing to determine yeah and if you it's a great it is actually quite objective if you're observing something physical yeah yeah and it's it's like a you know it's relative to that shoulder or in that you know, breast or arm or whatever, this head should be this big. Right. You know, and you have a rough idea of how big it should be. And if you make it way too small or way too... Everybody too sees it. Well, well and you're probably thinking of, like, your job or, you know, your mortgage, or, yeah. your kids, your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever. And it's like, you know, what he was saying is that when you see somebody make a mistake in drawing, you can tell that they're, they were thinking about something else. Right. You know? And when you see a beautiful figure drawing, because, you know, I think it's, it's especially newsprint drawing to me, is really cool because it's so temporary. It's, yes. It's like, you know, newsprint doesn't last long. It is a bad archival surface. You know, it. Yeah, it's, it's like a lot of work to difficult. conserve that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's like you only can really do three hour efforts on it. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, once. It, yeah. Three to six, maybe. Like you really need to be taking your time to. And after that, it's like it. it you actually like, 
you know, if you get some fancy, you know, linen paper or something, you know, it's like sure you can do like hundred hour efforts on this. Oh yeah. But yeah, yeah, you could do long ass efforts on those. But um, you know, the beauty of figure drawing is that it's like you actually have a limitation to how long you can work on it for. Yeah, and it, especially have, when from a live model. Like and you could fuck up the paper too. Hundred percent. And there's something you will, you should. Well, it, it, right. it's but but it's like if you make a mistake, you can't come back from certain mistakes. You you have to commit. You have to make these decisions. Hundred so, percent. You know, I think there's a beauty in how committal you have to be and how intentional you have to be with your decisions yeah like, i think it forces somebody who like i deal with anxiety and for me it forced me to put myself in a place where i have to think about how this laying in this core shadow is going to affect the paper yeah so you have to make sure it's a, a precise pressure and yep yep and then you after after doing that for a while and getting a feel for your materials yep. it does become less mental yeah you can just know like you'll have your threshold set where like, if I push any harder than this, it's too much. Yeah. And you'll naturally like hit that limit and not go further. Right. But you only learn that by really messing up the materials multiple times, like right? Thousands of times. Thousands of times. Yeah. And it's like, that's, I was teaching for a short period of time in this like kids group in Escondido. And that was one of the first things that I had them do was sit down and draw with the materials that we're giving you, it was just a pencil and newsprint, right? And I wanted them to sit down and ruin the paper. Yeah. Learn that, learn how far you can push it and how far you, like what it takes to destroy the paper, the materials, okay. push it so that you can calibrate yourself to that. Right. And if you don't do that, you're gonna do it while you're trying to do a drawing, but yeah. you could do it outside of the drawing in a context where you're just playing with the materials. Yeah. So I did a lot of that. Um, anytime I pick up a new thing, like a new, process or a new material it's like i want to see what this can do what it can handle and what where its limit is absolutely yeah. and I, I think that that's like i mean we talked about this at the watts where you were kind of disappointed that there weren't any materials classes on like like you don't spend 10 weeks just like like painting but not doing anything representational just making forms you know just doing yeah essentially like imagination doodles just with oil paint or paper or you know just to get an idea of mm -hmm. I, I really feel that, especially with something like traditional drawing, a lot of the issues that people run into, it's material-based problems. Yeah. yeah, at the beginning, it's it's a combination of materials and dexterity, yeah. and then there is, a, of course, the net, the li like their limit of their eye and what they can see and what they've taught themselves to see or what yeah. they've learned to see. Right. So, if you sit somebody down and you've never, and they've never done a. Uh, a figure drawing on newsprint with a charcoal pencil. Yeah. That's their first time doing it. They're going to do a bad drawing yeah. relative to the people that have been sitting next to them that are used to the materials, used to moving their hand in that way, used to sitting at a drawing horse for hours. Yeah. Like it, it's all gonna become something you have to adjust to, right? Even if you're an experienced craftsman too. It's, it's still, yeah, they're all still factors for yeah. sure. Right. Um, and switching, switching from like the, it seems kind of silly because all you're doing is switching pencils. Yeah. But switching from a Conte 1710B, which I had used for like a year straight, and then I switched to the Wolf Carbons, and I used like a 4B, yeah. and the the pressure difference, I was uncomfortable with how much more energy I had to put in to get it down to the low, lower values. Right. And that was like, that those types of things can be alleviated by going back to your basics and doing a value chart, right. which doesn't require a ton of dexterity to do a value yeah, chart. Yeah, right? so well, it, it's very much uh, the Mr. Miyagi. You know, yes, you yeah. Know, and I don't know. It's strange. It's it's like a seeing, you know, doing that stuff as a student is like, oh, this is useless. You know, I just yeah, I yeah. want to start drawing anatomy. I want to start doing the it's, fun stuff. It's really an oversight. Yeah. that a lot of people make. Right. I mean, that's the you know everyone wants to get to the flashy anatomy. Yeah because they want to show how much they know. Right. But it's, that's not the way to do it. Well, I, I mean, it, it's been strange, like, you know, seeing, um, like being involved in more educational things, you know, with Proco or, you know, just proximity to other people and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm looking at drawings from like a, not, not quite an instructor, but like a critiquer, critiquer's point of view and seeing how accurate most people's anatomy and proportions are. Like, it, you know, you could tell that that's a head, right? You could right. tell. Like the thirds are there, but it doesn't look like a good drawing. 
now. Yes. You know, which is strange, right? It's like, that's, it, you'll see that everything is actually literally correct, but there's something about it that's missing. Happens all the time. Well, and it, yeah. it, I think that would be incredibly discouraging for a student who's like, I've learned the things, why aren't my drawings good, you know? I've yep. learned the thirds, I've learned where the brachialis is, I, you know, it's, why isn't this a good drawing? And I think it's that stuff. It's like a, you know, the calligraphy, the, yes. you know, what it's like, you know, to spend a year just doing circles and yeah. lines. And it's like, what yes. would that do for your drawings? You like know? every day, like that was my warm up. I would wake up in the morning. I would like typically like go for a walk or work out yeah. in Encinitas. And then I would sit down at my own drawing horse and do lines, circles, like curvy lines. And then I would go into simple forms like cubes and cylinders Yeah. every time, right. every day. And it was like that, that seems stupid until you bridge the link between complex anatomy and simple forms and the construction kind of mentality, right? Yeah. Like every leg is a cylinder, right. you know? And if That's you can't, true. if you can't yeah. place a cylinder, you're, you're going to have a hard time with a leg. Right. So why are you focusing on that? Focus on the thing that is more tangible and more right. immediate. Well, and I, I, again, I think it's ego, you know? It's well, like, it's definitely ego. And then it's like the, I want to get there now, right. which is like impatience, which is also ego. Yeah. So yeah, that's, yeah. And I, you know, I can only say that because I've been humbled in that way many times thinking, right. thinking that because I'm more advanced or I've taken this class three times before, and this is my, you know, whatever, 200th, 20 minute lay in that I can somehow skip yeah. something. Right. And then you do that and you do that for maybe a month or two and your drawings look like crap. Yeah. And it's like, well, it's cause you're, you're thinking you're done. Right. with the fundamentals yeah. you're never done with the fundamentals yeah. it, it's always relevant right well I, I would say it's actually the most important thing like, yeah like that's as all you, there is well as you become a better artist your your tastes become more solidified so you know exactly what you want to draw you know exactly how you think shapes would, should be so yeah it becomes about translating those shapes into onto paper you know, yes in 3d yeah. forms right 100 percent yep um and, and that's that's the that's a really awkward phase where you're developing You've got some skill, some dexterity, and you're developing what you want it to look like. Yeah. That period where you don't know, but you know what's wrong, is so that can be really debilitating yeah. because it's like I'm studying, I'm doing all this work, I'm drawing, and I'm good, meaning like there's accuracy, I'm competent, but I don't like how it looks. Yeah, that's that can be rough right. a lot. So it's and it's discouraging. It's right. discouraging. It's yeah. Discouraging. And that's why we're studying other people comes in. Like if there's something about someone else's drawing or painting that you like so much that you want to paint it, extract that from it. Uh, Cause it's probably something in there for you. Yeah. Well, I, I would see you, you know, be doing these like clear windowing studies or something. I still study clear windowing. Well, I, I, I think I always will. But, but your drawings don't look anything like her calligraphy. Not at all. It's, it's her <laughs> but it's like her shapes and, yeah. you know. It's, it's uh, the, every artist that I study intensely uh, I'm looking for certain things. Yeah. And so there's compositional things she does with edges in her, her drawings right. where she'll like leave an entire area open or uh, lock down a shape in a certain way. And I just, I go, ah, oh, you know what? I want to draw that. Not because I necessarily am going to be able to pull that off, but maybe in my forties I'll be able to do something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Right. right. But, but it's, it's interesting enough, um, that, that I was like, I can sit and study this for three hours and it's engaging and I'm having fun. Yeah. Uh, then there's also the, honestly, like I've moved on from, from doing simple shapes and I typically will start warming up with a study. Right. It's a good way to prime my brain for how to think. Yeah. So Claire Wendling, she has like the calligraphy, um, that matches in, if you compare, uh, Bridgman with Claire Wendling, yeah. there are some planar hatch marking kind of sync, like they mesh quite well. It's very yeah. linear. Um, and you can, there's like good crossover there. And so I actually didn't have any, after studying her, I went back to Bridgman and I was like, oh, I can understand what he's trying to do now because yeah. he's turning form in a similar way. Right. Um, but of course, all of that stuff, you can't really get to that point until you understand how light works, how form works. Yeah. So you do have to go through those periods where you're just rendering a cube. Right. And it's like, okay, this is boring, but got to do it how, you know everything everything can be broken down into a simple shape so if you know how to render that you can keep going and figure it out well i think it's that ego death and embracing the fundamentals is again true across all mediums of art where it's playing the piano or programming or any of that kind of stuff 3d modeling yeah. um you know it, it's or botany even yeah you know, it's all fundamentals about, yeah fundamentals and it, it's it's uh again 
um, I've been talking to a lot of people about the idea of God and spirituality and stuff. And, you know, I don't necessarily consider myself any particular religion, like a sure. Islamic or Christian or Jewish or anything, but it's, I, I've, I've been seeing that stuff as more relevant where it's like um, trying to embrace the idea that you are just like an imperfect, you know. Yeah, per- like, perfectly imperfect. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Like, like I, you know, there, I'm sure you've heard this quote where it's like, you know, you're simultaneously the most complicated thing in the universe. Yeah. And also some something and somebody that can't set the clock on your microphone. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know. Yeah, it's like, it's that's real though. It's like. Well, I, I have a question for you. Do you think Elon Musk knows how to set the clock on his microphone? I bet he has somebody else to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, nah, I don't need to not do yeah, it. Yeah, well, and exactly. It's like, he's like, I could learn how to do that, but, you know, it's like. I don't have enough attention to like. No, yeah, geez, yeah. I, I can't even imagine what it's like to to live life at that scale. It's it's not that different, I don't think. I mean, it's it's like the problems that you're solving are the same problems that like Leonardo da Vinci was solving. Yeah, you know? form and light, and yeah, it's just yeah. different, you know, different scales. It's it's a uh, man. I just that I have to just say this because we're talking about the fundamentals and just the art journey, right? Yeah, and that at the end of the day, if if you enjoy it enough to get through the period where you're the worst you've ever been, yeah. it gets, it does consistently keep getting better. And better. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's it, more fun because you, it, like, your creativity opens up. Well, and I, I found that it's the same thing with reading, you know, or, or any, again, playing guitar. It's like the more that you can play and the more stuff becomes intuitive, the more justified it becomes to go out and do fun things. It, it's yeah. like going out and sucking at drawing becomes fun because you're like embracing the idea of like oh man i'm learning this thing it's i'm gonna be good at this dude you know that was the first that was like uh that was why the the period where i wasn't studying at the school was was harder than the period where i was not because i was doing harder work it was the no no community support no one around me to draw with right and being able, being just alone in your own thoughts about your own drawings is b- right. not a good place to be typically, unless yeah. you're very mentally balanced and you've learned that lesson. Right. Um, but yeah, for me, it was the biggest thing about the school was that well, the only way I could sit and draw from for like eight to ten hours a day, right. sometimes twelve. Like we would, we would, some of us would just like only draw all day for yeah. days. Um, but you can only do that because I'm getting social engagement with the people around me. Absolutely. I and, have and friends, and we would go out to eat, and we would take breaks together, and, you know. Well, and there's a competitive, a competitive nature to it, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'm not really a competitive guy. A little bit, but, but it's like when you see another student that's like, oh, he's getting really good. Yeah. Man, that's awesome. That's 100%. So cool. and, yeah. you know, and it's like, well, that is, there's like a, like when I saw, because like for a period there, Chris Periano was, and still is in many ways, really quite better at figure than I am. Yeah. And at least in terms of shape design and like, he was he was just rocking it for like a hot six months there yeah. when I was there and I, right. the rest I don't know what he's doing right now but and all that but that was like I'm not a competitive person but that did motivate me yeah. to be like because we we were at school at about the same time right. uh, we're training through a lot of the same layers of information at the same time yeah. and I remember I remember that being like a okay yeah. like. You know, check yourself. Make sure you're staying on the path. Absolutely. Yeah. Not not in a I need to be better than Chris, but it's like somebody keeps we were about. we were getting good at the same time and in in a lot of the same ways, getting yeah. better and increasing our skills. And then suddenly he had a, he had a jump, and it goes okay. Well, what have I been doing? Yeah. You know, and it's it's yeah, it's an ego check. It's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, and again, I think that that you know, um, the idea of learning how to draw at a master level is I think it's both incredibly simple and incredibly complicated where yeah there's a lot to do with like going and surrounding yourself with people to keep you accountable to kill your ego and to yeah to keep you, know. you in check yeah. and i think you don't even necessarily need that stuff if you are spiritually aligned in the proper way yeah no you don't that's that's like the that's like the the way to get to that discipline right yeah. like if you're an 18 19 year old kid just out of high school and you've never had to deal with waking up in the morning to go work out yep. or a sport or anything like that. You've just kind of floated through right. and you didn't ever learn discipline. You're going to need to. Yep. But if you already learn that in another fact, in another area of your life and you can apply it, yep. you will get better faster. Well, and I, I 
found that like I've been getting really into cycling in the past couple of years. Yeah, I've seen that. It's well, and that's made me a way better artist than anything 100%. than drawing ever has. Yeah. You know, I found that like when I would draw, I, I would only ever worry about like subconsciously my ego. You know, I like I, I mean yeah. I, everyone does, but it's at like, some point, yeah, everyone does. Like um, you're thinking about it. Yeah, and it, and it's like. But when you're drawing or when you're riding a bike really far, you have, you can't think of anything else other than yourself. Especially, like, I was telling you, the longest I've ever done in a day is 112 miles. That's know? nuts. And at, like, mile 60 or 70, you're, like, in so much pain that you're, like, I don't care about the likes. I don't care what anyone's going to Yeah, it's like, this. none of this matters. It's just stick with it. Well, and, and it's, like, the thing that keeps me going isn't necessarily... I'm not going to say it's my, like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be... It, it's, it's fear. It's, like... You know, I'm I'm in the middle of nowhere, 40 miles away from my destination. If I don't find a place to sleep, I'm gonna be sleeping on the side of the road. Right. You know. Oh, because you were solo biking. Well, I, I was with a couple of friends. Right. It was like I'm in the middle of New York. I'm in the middle of Bron. I'm in the, I was. I, it was in Long Island. Okay. So I was in the middle of like some place I don't know. You know? That's that, this is interesting. Uh, it kind of comes back to that's that's related in a sense to the sort of commitment to the outcome. Yeah that there's like a resolution that happens in any process of trying to pursue something like a bike ride or whatever it is where you settle in and you go okay whatever happens I'm, it's gonna i'm gonna do it yeah. and, it, and it's inevitable all i have to do is just keep going yeah and then after that thought passes and really solidifies in your mind you actually don't need to think about it that much anymore. no no no, no, no yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's oh, yeah, just I'll, a, I'll get there eventually. it's like yes it's a it's it's like a calm calming down absolutely yeah, yeah like yeah. a settling which is nice and it that happened um that happened in a more abstract way i had a, i have a buddy here cody who's a close friend of mine and he when i was first moving out to the atelier i was thinking i was i was creating backup options yeah i was like you know if the atelier stuff doesn't work maybe i can come back to minnesota and i can go to minnesota college of art design and that's right. in minneapolis and they've got a drawing program or whatever and he he was a very he's a very blunt honest person he said yeah you're planning for failure that's yeah. not going to get you where you want to go right don't think about option b there is only option a yeah and it's like that's what gets you through is that you go oh this is it right there is no way around it well and no matter what school you're going to the act of drawing stays the same <laughs> yes right? of course. it's like like even if i was going 200 miles that day mm -hmm. the act of what i was doing in the moment was going to stay the same i just keep pedaling yeah know? there is no other option right. um and it doesn't have to be some like dreary, dreadful like uh, I like have to resign myself to this path. Uh, right. It's like no, that's not what you want to be in, right. and you can't be that way forever. You have to just calmly accept the thing you've chosen. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, um, and again, there's a deeply spiritual element to that where it forces you to be in the moment. It's like we were talking. I, I don't know. We so we know so many good artists, and yeah. I know a bunch of them who. Like they're so far along the path and they still struggle with the anxiety of doing art you know it's like and they're at a much higher they actually deal with way more anxiety than us because they're like their livelihoods are on the line they can't pay their mortgage if they don't sell paintings sure they, you know have kids they have wives they have businesses yeah, though they're at a different place in their life right well and, and it's like it, it doesn't like you actually start to gain more things that should cause you anxiety you start to go at a up at a higher level and um, yeah, the stakes get higher. It, it, but the thing that changes is you. You know, it's it's the way you see those problems, and it's yeah. it's all about embracing like the, oh yeah, I I owe a hundred thousand dollars to this person, and there's nothing I can do about it other than draw this picture. You know, right? It's, it's like oh yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's what it is. Like, it, yeah. well, that's the. There are some people that do really really well with external motivation. Yeah, having somebody coach them or push them, whatever it may be, and. I've for me that has never worked. Yeah. It has to be internal. Yeah. Um, otherwise, it'll fall away yeah. when the external circumstances change, which Absolutely. they will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So you have to be the kind of still point. Well, and I, I found that that's the uh, um, that's fundamentally what I believe success is. It's it's not necessarily nepotism. It's not about external circumstances. It's about how you feel about yourself. Yeah, like, I mean. It, the mindset it's a, a no, mindset I, no matter who you are and I think it's like it, it always just comes down to mindset like you know I, I think you know of course people have different levels of opportunity and I'm, I, this is more of a philosophical statement but I sure. think it's a, like you know uh, yeah. 
So to, don't touch that, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah, it's going to be super hot. Yeah. <laughs> Burn your hand. But um, it's way more about, like, it doesn't matter how many opportunities you have, you know? It doesn't matter if, like, tomorrow George Lucas asked you to design Star Wars, you know? You actually, well, but, but he, you actually might not be ready for it. No, know? probably not. And, it, and it's like, you know, but there's a version of you that is, right? And it's like... That's fair, yeah. That, that had the same amount of time and did the same amount of things. It's just there's a difference in mindset that... And I, again, I don't know. Like, maybe you are actually ready. I'm just saying abstractly. And like, for me, I've had a lot of opportunities through my dad. And I've fucked a lot of them up. Not necessarily fucking them up, but I was just like... Didn't do the best I could because I was like too young I just didn't sure yeah. you know, well I think I've done the same types of things uh, like I've had plenty of opportunities through you to go do certain types of work yeah and I knew at a core level like when when those opportunities first started popping up like card art and things yeah. like that I was like no I'm actually not ready yeah. for that yet I'm close and I could feel that and I was like uh, not quite yet yeah um, because I knew that there was there was more that I wanted to do and explore, and as much you know, I I also do. There's a point where that that adopting the perpetual student mindset is useful because everything is like a learning experience, and and you could say every painting is a study. The only difference is sometimes you put a frame around them, yeah, and then it's done because you're done working on it. Right. But they're all studies, and you're you are always being a student and learning. Yeah. But that mindset also can cripple you from understanding that like no you need to, the pro, a professional versus a student are very different it's, the attitude is very different yeah you're still doing a study you're, but it the way you present yourself and move through the world needs to be professional yeah um, and that honestly the, the difference between a professional and a student is, is going to be things like uh, emailing your client and communication and it might not even be the art skill. Soft skills. Soft skills, which yeah. many people are lacking, and I obviously could improve on as well. Oh, well, I, I don't know, but I think it's like a... Um, it doesn't matter which opportunity... Like, I think the thing that I'm finding by driving around the country is that opportunity is actually extremely common. It's everywhere. It's, it's everywhere. In, it's insane. Like, if we... Like, I suspect that if we walked into the Capitol building of Minnesota and offered to do a mural for $30,000, there's a reality where we actually... Get Maybe if we stuck with it and like kept, it's like selling our, our idea out. We'd probably get yeah, it. But like even today, it's like we walked in and just like pitched that to you know, like I was talking to a, a business mentor of mine, and he was saying you know he's worth a ton of money, right? Like more money than I'll ever be worth. And he was like, I was don't thinking, say that. Well, it like hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, it's like I I don't know. I don't I don't even know if I want to be. You know, <laughs> sounds kind of stressful. But yeah, um, I was talking to him, and he was saying it's like. And I was thinking about this too, like if I had a good enough idea and had enough, you know, evidence that it would be successful, whether it's spreadsheets, my previous background, my personality, you know, my current work, you know, mm -hmm. like if I had enough things that could convince him that, you know, it was a viable business idea, then he actually might give me like a million dollars to go and try and execute it. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of people that are looking for good investments. Absolutely. Well, and it's like, at but. that point, it's, it's like, it's not about... Like it's it's all about having the courage and the bravery to say that your investment is good enough to be given a million dollars. Yeah, that it's know? worth the shot. Yeah, 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 and it's like, I found that I've met people in every state like that. They have money, whether it's not necessarily a million dollars, but maybe it's like ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, I mean, whatever dollars. amount, right? Like. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's like, the only thing that is holding me back isn't me. It's not the lack of opportunity because I, you know, I believe anyone can go into, like anyone can walk into the Capitol building of their state and make some grand you know claim or some business pitch sure and it's just up to them to make it good enough to sell it yeah. to sell it right mm -hmm. and at that point it's not about anything anyone else can do for you it's everything that yeah, okay. it's um it's it's about what you, what you can do for yourself like how long can you well sell? yeah what, what you can do for them too like well, that's uh, oh yeah absolutely and, um but like, I, I, um, you know, I mean, I, I've shown you to, like, I've shown your art to people, mm. and, you know, in person, they've been like, oh, I, mean, I want you to be my art coach, I want you to, like, I want to hire you right now, and, you know, and it's like, it's, it's a lot more complicated than just taking the job, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
there's there's some kind of I've I've had this thought because uh, I've reflected on like my place in the art world and all that you yeah. know and it's obviously changing and art itself is changing quite rapidly along with everything else um, but my the idea of teaching people is I'm I'm not super excited about that right now I think I've thought about it and I, I kind of looked at Jeff as a mentor and an example and seeing how I think maybe he he dif, he disagreed but a lot of his best teachings have been recently a lot of his best students too yeah. because of the multiple generations that he's had go through the school and so in my yeah. opinion because I experienced it a lot of his best teachings has been happening now in his 50s yeah and I'm 30 yeah. and so it's like uh, maybe I'll maybe I'll do that type of teaching right. in my 50s yeah. when I've got multiple periods of going through different cycles in my career life and whatever uh, maybe when I'm a little more wise yeah. but uh, I, there's definitely a, a potential where I'm I would love to like coach people and, and progress in art with them yeah. and do some sort of pseudo mentorship but I actually like the idea more so of just collaborating on a project yeah. and everyone just helps the ship float kind of an idea you know it's like yeah. that's a little more relaxed I'm I, there's a sort of responsibility you take on when you say okay you're my student I'm your teacher yeah. and I don't I have yet to meet someone a student where I that like wants me to teach them yeah. I have yet to meet somebody that is like I want you to teach me right so well, if anyone is listening and wants Lucas to teach you... I am open to mentoring yes, and coaching, yes. for sure. Um, I highly recommend it. When I was at Watts, Lucas was a very uh, helpful helpful person. But and because I'm the kind of person where I... Well, thank you for that. But the uh, I would... At my teaching style, if I were even to have one, would be to promote the self-learning. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, Which it, is what it always is, ultimately. But absolutely. Well, and it, again, it's it's like a encouraging people to play. You know, and if people are being taught by you, you're not teaching them how to draw exactly like you. Right. I wouldn't want that. You're teaching yeah. people to draw like them. Mm -hmm. and, that's that's what it is. That's like the secret, is that you have to, you have to get to the point where you're independently able to determine your path. Yeah. And then that's when the teaching kind of ends, and it becomes more of like a co. Friendship. development yeah, Friend, yeah. it's a friendship of yeah, course yeah. but and, and it's and then it becomes like a peer Absolutely. relationship which is way better for me personally yeah I, I I don't like like if somebody gives me authority and power over them it makes me uncomfortable well and you actually can't learn from them right no. the, the relationship doesn't you know when they're constantly... I mean you can still if you take on the attitude of like everyone is can teach you something yeah. but you have to you know that, that dynamic of, of teacher student right. isn't that interesting to me yeah yeah right. but coaching and and kind of like helping people develop their portfolios or even just tackle a certain challenge totally yeah yeah right. that's super fun yeah um well and I, I again i think that that's the ideal scenario it's like a um like you i, I don't really, i don't know if you do it for free but if it were perfect you might do it for free if it were like the you know something that kept you engaged kept you curious you know it's way more like I've heard a lot of teachers, you know, there's a cliche in teaching where it's like, I'm not doing this for you. I'm doing this for me because seeing sure, you, seeing you grow is, you know. Well, yeah, and that's part of the. That's pretty you know, cool. Like, yeah, yeah. What a what an awesome thing to be able to look back on and say like this person gained their ability to express themselves in this way be partially because of you. Right. Of course, at the end of the day, like, no matter what teacher you have, you're you are ultimately on your own. Yeah. It's got to be self. Again, internally self-motivated. It can be externally motivated for a little bit, like ego motivated. I gotta be better than this person. I want to be just as good as them, or I want to take their job and whatever. Eventually, that that stuff's kind of like you see it for what it is. Well, it's just temporary it, ego stuff. I believe that's the dark side of art education. Yeah, is that it, it? It's something that encourages somebody to be in a school for ten years and to c constantly put teachers up on almost like a, a hierarchy of them being a celebrity or something. Sure. Yeah. And I think that that ultimately detracts from the potential of the student if they're constantly being sold, like, oh, take a workshop here, and then take a workshop here, and then do this, and then, yeah. like, then it can, you'll finally be good. It can know? be it can be damaging yeah. to the actual path that they're on. Right. Like, um, 
taking taking a workshop when you're not ready yeah. is a complete waste. Yeah. Uh, however, again, it's going to be the attitude of this. You have to adopt the student attitude and come away with whatever learning you can extract. Right. That's going to be on the student. Well, and I, I, honestly, I think that being ready is a subjective thing. It's like a, be a beginner yeah. might be ready for a master workshop painter if he's like, you know, doing it in the proper way. Yeah, totally. And that's the that would be the difference between a, a great teacher yeah. would be somebody that says, look, this is an advanced technique, but because you're here and we're here together, let's see what you can do, and yeah. hopefully you'll come away with something. Well, And you just do that for hundreds of hours and well, yeah, I, I, you'll figure it out. For, for me, I, I was totally on... I wasn't ready to take the... Uh, Illustration boot camp. I I, I've I've taken that thing three times, and each time I was on, not ready. I was I've never. I don't think I'll ever be ready. But no. I I, to, I did like an embarrassingly bad painting, and I'm like, same. I was like, holy shit, this is like. I thought you know just hot garbage. It was, I was like, I I pretty much destroyed the painting. I think. I yeah, I tossed one of them. I was like, this is. I'm never letting anyone see this. Yeah, yeah. It was just like, and but I did learn a lot from it from the perspective of I I got to see what it's like to be an, an illustrator for a few days. And yeah. I was like, Fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, to be fair, the Watts Illustration Boot Camp um, is a week. Yeah. And if you don't have, if you're, if you aren't prepared to begin painting the final image on the first day, yeah. you're going to spend two thirds of the, that week doing the planning. Yeah. And then you're going to try to execute a painting. No, you're not going to get it done. And they tell you that beforehand. Their your your goal is to not finish a painting. It's to expose yourself to the process of. Yeah. the whole thing right but uh the few times that i took the illustration boot camp i worked with eric and he would give prompts and uh do like a blog post beforehand and link everybody to it so that they could get some preparation before right otherwise you are just jumping in and it's it's just a whirlwind well i found that my ego thought for like a month afterwards that it was a waste of time you know because i'd done a terrible painting but the actual benefit i got of it got from it was i got to see what it's like to hang around a bunch of illustrators and see how they think yeah know, and see that like this is not a path i actually want to pursue you know yeah and it's i i did the same thing uh in a, well in a certain sense i learned from from the illustration boot camps what it feels like to be in to fail embarrassingly yeah in front of a lot of people that you admire that yeah. i admire However, luckily, the teachers are, of course, they're never out to embarrass you. Yeah. And they're always, like, trying to be productive and right. yes and you and get you to keep going, right? Because yeah. that's, like, that is what it takes. to You yeah. just have to push through the failure. Um, but it was mindset. It was mindset. Like, there were, there were artists there that were, like, professionals that were coming to, like, to, like, give a talk and do, like, a demo. Right. And it was like, oh, shit, like, these guys are fucking good. They're professionals. I'm not yeah. a professional. But I was competent at drafting and drawing yeah. and not comfortable with oil painting at all. Yeah. And so that transition was so rough that I was, I, it was too early yeah. to be painting. Right. Um, but I didn't learn that it was too early. I didn't learn that I was in over, over my head until I went through that process of yeah. just producing a garbage painting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and they, Sink 20 hours into something and it just ends up in the dump. Well, and again, going back to the idea of being a beginner in a master setting, you know, it's like yeah. you can still learn a lot even though you're not a professional oil painter. You know, you learn. Yeah, you can be really a really bad student and still learn a lot if you're in the right environment. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's an ego check. It's like I, I felt like, oh, I'm good and I'm pretty good at drawing. So, like <laughs> doing an oil painting, at least I can like do something. Sure. It's like, oh shit. <laughs> well, like, dude, 100. percent That that like I remember the process of shifting from from charcoal uh, pencil drawings right to to painting yeah. I went through probably a six month period where I only did monochromatic paintings yeah. and I didn't even uh, use white paint I had a white canvas yeah. and just one pigment yeah. and it was such a relief to not have to think about color such a relief to be able to treat it like a drawing it, was, yeah. it felt like a drawing and that you know, it's good to take baby steps. I think ultimately, though, I probably would have benefited more by just painting in color yeah. more right away right. myself. But, um, but but it's it, fine. But, 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 like maybe not. Maybe there was that like 
the simplifying it and not painting in color was something that would actually make you do it. You know? Yeah, well, that was the thing. Yeah. It made it less. It it was what I needed to keep my fear of failure in check. Yeah, and to keep to to not add so many new variables that I got overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes it tangible. It makes it like okay, I can break down now instead of like trying to figure out color and mixing. I can just work on uh, controlling oil paint yeah. and edge work, yeah. and that's it. And just accurate shape placement, and and you know, just like Richard Schmidt says in his book, a really beautiful monochromatic painting or drawing, ha honestly, can sometimes be more impactful than a color painting oh, yeah. if it's done well, of right. course. So yeah. um, to to dismiss, you know, oh, you're, you you need to be painting in color like you're not using the medium to its fullest extent it's like well, it's, you're missing the point you, you never are right no, that's like, true like yeah. you could always be painting bigger even if you're painting in color right? for sure yeah it's like a painting could be like a mile long you know? yeah it's like well no where, where's your limit and it's like <laughs> okay yeah I don't know I, and I think it's um, like I, have to, I, I mean I've talked to Scott about this where Scott's work doesn't have color in it at all yeah it's very monochromatic very, very, yeah. and it's like um, but I still think it's incredibly successful it's uh it's successful at what it's trying to do you know the intention is to communicate shape and yeah design, you know? for sure you know? I, I mean that's the great thing about all these different art disciplines is that uh well sub disciplines i'll say because it's all like it's all you know shape line form edge all that stuff color but your focus on one of those subjects can can completely change the flavor of, of your painting yeah. or your whatever you're doing, and seeing what people care about come through their paintings is like one of the most interesting things Absolutely. about it. It's like watching, looking at a John Asaro painting and seeing how he uses color. It's like I don't even think like that. Yeah. But, well, and, 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 and there's that cliche that your mistakes are the thing that makes you you. You know, that makes you <laughs> unique. That's kind of yeah. It's definitely true. And I, I don't know. I like I. Like you saw my sketchbook. Like I've been trying to get a, like as far away from the Watts stuff as I possibly can, and I've been enjoying drawing way more than I have in like two years. Two oh years. yeah, and it, it's yeah. not necessarily like they're it's, they're not not like necessarily good drawings, but they're good drawings to me because they're successful at what I'm trying to do. Yeah, and you're enjoying it. Yeah, yeah, which, which is, is again way more successful than doing something that like somebody's like, oh, that's cool, that's a, that's an impressive drawing. You know? Yeah. Well, I get that. Like I I went through multiple periods where I was drawing just like the standard class stuff we were doing 20 minute lands figure and head quick sketch and then longer figure yep. and then some anatomy studies and drapery and all these things and it was a, at no fault no fault to the teachers or the school but I was just like I am so bored of this stuff right. and that's when I started taking Tom's animal classes I was like, I need to paint something other than naked people, because yeah. I've been doing this for a year and a half, and I really am not interested in it right now. So I dived into animals and birds and, and things like that, and it's like, this is enough of a difference where I'm solving different problems, it's different forms, and I can I can enjoy this new thing. Right. And uh, you have to be able to follow that excitement. Yeah. That's the key. Like. If you're if something is emotionally kind of dead for you, don't like take that for what it is. Yeah, you know, don't don't just be like I must be disciplined and do the thing I don't want to do every day. It's like, meh, Fuck no, you. Yeah. like that's that's actually not gonna lead to an inspiring painting. Oh yeah, yeah, and I, I, honestly, I think that's ego again. It's ego. Yeah, it, it's like lying. And I, again, I, I think it's all, self deception. Yeah, yeah. One, all this stuff always comes back to the fundamentals and telling the truth. You know? Yeah. Like if you just tell the truth and you're like, I actually don't want to draw today. You know? mm -hmm. I actually don't want to draw a person. And, you know, yeah, it's like some days I, I sit down and I'll doodle, yep. and it will be sh just abstract shape designs right. or simple 3D forms, and I'm just rotating them in space just to keep that muscle going. Yep. I'll do it for like a half an hour, yep. and then I'll go do whatever I want to do. Well, and I, I remember um, we, I was talking to you one time after one of the terms ended. And you were saying you were just, like, not going to draw for two weeks or something. Yeah, I took, like, right after the term, I was like, I'm done for, like, two weeks. I'm just going to fuck around. Play video games. I literally was like, I'm going to go to the beach every day. Yeah, right. And after a week and a half, I was like, man, I'm really excited to paint. Yeah, right. Like, this is, that's great. But I I really needed that break. Yeah. You know? Right. 
And even, even on those days where I'm like, I'm just not going to draw and paint today. If I went and did what was exciting to me in the moment, maybe it's go to the beach, go to a movie, play a game for a bit. Eventually in that day, that excitement for that thing would fade. And I oftentimes still ended up drawing or painting, yeah. but I would just get into the, I, the mindset of, I'm just going to do what I want to do. I'm going to do what's fun. Right. And if it's drawing and painting, great. If it's not cool. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And right. that's honestly the following your excitement is honesty. It's like self honesty. It's, it's really like probably the best way to make your way through life. Yeah. Well, yeah, again, coming back to the fundamentals of like learning art has a lot to do with being a good person, being like a well-rounded person where it's like, yeah, just do what you want, you know, but do it honestly, like do what you want and be right yes. about it, you know, it's yeah. like what I want to do is draw and then go draw. If I, what I want to do is like sit around and play video games and you actually want to do that and you feel like there will, there will be no guilt associated with it. Yeah. Ugh, then, then it's like, oh, then go do it, you know? Well, I mean, what a great, what a great opportunity to explore why you feel guilty doing something you enjoy. Yeah. You know, if you feel, if you're, if you feel shame or guilt because you feel like you're quote unquote wasting time, then you're, you're, well, that you, you mindset, a lot of stuff to think about. Yeah. it's already destructive inherently in its mindset. Like it would be better for you to not get in that feeling yeah. and to just play games for an hour and then be done. Yeah. Like right. just do, do the thing you want to do, the stuff that you enjoy. Like for a lot of people, games are more than just like messing away time and having fun. It's social engagement. It's like all these other things. And especially nowadays with like the coronavirus and all that, like yeah. the remote work and everything, it's like, yeah, we need to make sure that we take time to enjoy just for enjoyment's sake. It's not hedonistic to do that. Yeah. It's, it's very important to just set aside purposefully fun. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Don't try to schedule fun though. That's, that doesn't, that oh, doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't schedule anything. I'm just kind of like, Oh, I want to do that. I do sometimes schedule, uh, I'll schedule work sessions, yeah. but they're loose in the sense that, uh, I'll, I'll sit down to work on something and then I will ask my, like, I'll sit and I'll just stare at a piece of paper for a bit, have my thing that I think I'm supposed to work on. But I always ask myself, what do I actually want to do? And typically it's something else for a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes it's the same painting, but right. and that could be good or could be bad, you know. I yeah. do have a tendency to jump around from projects to projects, but... I think most people do. Yeah, I think it's pretty normal. Yeah. Two to three hours per day on a thing and then move on to something else. Yeah. Um, do you want to wrap this up? Yeah, yeah. Cool. I'm cool with whatever. Is there anything you want to promote? I don't have a following, but you can I mean, tell if, this camera. Yeah, if you want to check out my website, lucaskramerart.com. And then I'm on Instagram, so same thing. Um, and if you uh, would like to learn from Lucas, he's a great teacher, and he's going to be doing some cool things. Yeah, you can always just message me, email me. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah. Appreciate dude, it. thank you. Dude, you came so far out just yeah, to come dude. see me. Heck yeah. Rural Minnesota, baby. Rural Minnesota. Cool. Thank you.